So like I said, this is part one. We're going to talk about warranties and product liability. And really, if you did start reading, you should have thought to yourself, this sounds kind of familiar. Because warranties are a lot like what? Contracts, right? Product liability is a lot like what other chapter did we talk about that this sounds kind of like? Well, just look up there on the slides. Strict product liability. What chapter did we talk about strict liability? Yes, chapter four, exactly. Uh, what was chapter four? Anybody remember? Torts, good. So we product liability is really torts again, just in a product setting. And warranties is all about promises, you know, and it's a lot like contracts. So when they talk about express and implied warranties, that should sound familiar, like express and implied contracts. And then at the end of the chapter, we won't get to this part today, um, they talk about consumer law. That's next week. So when I say warranty, you say, for the recording, the sound just cut out and they all responded, but couldn't pick it up. Anybody warrant? You ever played word association? I shout out a word and you all say something back? Contracts. Yeah, there you go. What? Promises. Promises. Good, because I've said both that already, contracts and promises. But just pretend you're not here, right? And somebody says, somebody jumps out from behind a tree and screams warranty at you. What do you say? Lifetime. There you go, right? I mean, you think about a document that says lifetime warranty or limited or as is, right? You see a white, you know, sign on a used car with a box checked or something. Maybe you're opening some package at Christmas and out comes this written document that says warranty or something. Anybody else? Anybody ever like go to Best Buy and you buy some small little thing and they're like, hey, would you like to buy an extended warranty? And you're like, that would cost way more than this, <laughs> right? Yeah. So maybe you've had experience there. Probably you haven't had anybody talk to you about these other warranties, like warranty of title. So a warranty of title is pretty much what it says. It's a warranty by the seller that what they're selling you is theirs to sell you. Which seems like a no-brainer, right? You would like to assume that it is. Uh, it means that they have good title to it, that there aren't any liens. Uh, in other words, if you think about Best Buy and all the stuff that's on their sales floor, do you think they own it all outright and pay cash for it? No. No. What did they do to get it? Some of it. They use, they use credit to get it, and then you're going to buy it, and then they're going to pay off their credit and keep the rest. So you don't want one day when you had your refrigerator or whatever you bought from Best Buy for somebody to show up and say, hey, Best Buy hasn't paid their bills. We want the fridge back, right? So they're warranting when they give you that fridge or stereo or whatever it is that there aren't any liens on it. If they sell you a DVD that it's not bootlegged, there's no infringements on it. Uh, this, that is a warranty that both the seller and the buyer put on a product. Not only they warrant that it's a authentic DVD that doesn't infringe on anybody else's intellectual property rights, but you warrant while you hold it that you won't do anything that's infringing with it. And the last bullet up there, if you see somebody trying to disclaim a title warranty, what should you do? Run. Right? Because, you know, what is that saying? That's saying, here, we'll sell it to you, we'll take your money, but we're not so sure if it's ours to sell you. So that's probably not a good thing. Sometimes you see that. Like, we disclaim all titles, including, ti or all warranties, including a uh, title warranty, and that should make you a little nervous. They're saying, well, maybe there is a lien we don't know about. All right, express warranties. Express means? Did you say fast? Yeah, written. That's right. Say it with disgust, like, where have you people been? Yes, it <laughs> express does mean fast. But in this setting, it means written or? Spoken. Yes, right? Express somehow, orally or written. So that's the type of warranty we're talking about, just like we talked about express contracts. A representation of fact, not opinion, about the quality, condition, description, or performance of a product. I'm coming to uh, this point 
in my year where my cell phone contract is up and my car is breaking down and I feel like I need to get something new. So maybe you guys give me advice as to what cell phone I should get or car I should get. Any suggestions? Well, maybe you should go with a clear. I like the black. Yeah. Iphone. iPhone. Yeah, I got one of those. I like my Blackberry. Yeah. <laughs> what? I don't like AT&T. <laughs> Are you in Verizon? I'm switching. What? Are you in Verizon? I have an iPhone. Oh, oh, it's just that no. All right. So anyway, <laughs> regardless of what I get, right? Let's say I go into the Verizon, and I'm looking at phones. I'm looking at the Droid. Ooh, that sounds cool. They have those robotic commercials. I bet their phone is going to turn me into some kind of robot, right? <laughs> that would be cool. Um, what's that? Really? Yeah. It's an alternative, I guess. I, I, I was on Verizon, loved the service, left it for the iPhone. Yeah, AT&T is not as good with service. Not that I'm slandering them in any way. It's just my own personal experience, my opinion. Uh, so I go into the store, and I'm looking for a droid, and uh, there's a model there, right? It's not the real one that I'm going to get, but it's... One that says what to me? Because they speak, they go, droid. But even when they don't, it says what to me? It says, buy me. It says, you, you like me, I'm better than the iPhone. It talks to me, right? You like me, I have a keyboard. Ooh. Some of them have keyboards. So, But basically what I'm pointing out is the second bullet there, that if I do get a phone, it should conform to what the model is there. Hopefully it'll have a lot less oily fingerprints on it and be less scratched and mangled up, but it should be like that. It should be the same size screen, the same keyboard or whatever, the software that's on it. Um, and I would rely on that. According to the third bullet, that would be the basis of the bargain. I'm buying it because I believe that that model reflects what I'm going to get and have for two stinking years. Uh, but it's not just what I see. It could be a written warranty that goes with the product, right? But it also could be what else? I mean, think of all the potential warranties. It's not just what's sitting there that I pick up and play with. It's not just what's in writing when I get it, but what else might happen? How, how, how else might a warranty be created? Right, by what somebody says to me about that phone. Now, if the salesperson's smart, they'll stay away from doing anything more than opinion. Man, you look good with that phone, right? Well, thanks. I guess I'll buy it. But that's just an opinion, really. That it's probably not even accurate. It's probably just puffery, they call it. So statements of opinion don't make warranties, but if they said something like it has this megapixel camera on it, then I would believe that it did. Unless an easy inspection could reveal that it didn't have a camera. Right. Um, let's see, what else? So you know, my best example is a used car. Right, You go onto the used car lot and things that they say about the product could create a warranty. Things that are in the window could create a warranty. Um, you ask how many miles it has on it. They're depending on what they say to you. If, you're, if you know that everything you say or do could create a warranty, when somebody asks you how many miles a car has on it, what do you do? You just you tell the truth. Always tell the truth. That's good. You just say, hey, look, there it is. You don't represent something because if you represent it, then it is considered something that they're going to rely on, and it's warranting that it has that many miles on it. All right. Now there's a couple implied warranties. Whoops. Uh, the first one is the implied warranty of merchantability. Who creates the implied warranty of merchantability? Let me try again. Who creates the implied warranty of merchant ability? Let's try this. Who creates the implied warranty of merchant? Ability. Merchant. All right, now it works. I thought the long pause would help, <laughs> but maybe the emphasis on the word merchant. Yes, merchants do, right? So one thing you got to know 
if there's this implied warranty that only merchants can create is what is a merchant? Any theories? Buy? No, buyers aren't merchants. Well, I mean, they could be, but that we're talking about it's created by a seller. So, who, not and not every seller is a merchant. What did you say? Mm, not usually. Like, whoever makes the droid phone is probably not a merchant. They're probably just spitting them out, right? And then sending them off to resellers or... Right, sellers who are in the business of selling them. So AT&T stores or Verizon stores, those are merchants as to phones. What aren't they merchants as to? Cars. 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 <laughs> Eggs. Yeah. Well, service is another story, right? I mean, they, they're probably both. Like, they're not in the business of phones, hardware, or they go out of business. Like, some of them they just give away. It's really about selling a long-term contract and charging more than they're worth. So, uh, yeah, cell phone companies, cell phone uh, resellers are merchants as to phones. So a merchant is somebody who sells that kind of product all the time or represents themselves to be a merchant. Are you a merchant by selling your car in your front yard? No. no. You're a seller at least. Now, could you be a merchant selling cars out of your front lawn? Yeah. Or if you got a license, or you might try to avoid getting a license by just selling all cars out of your front yard. But at some point, the law would say, you're a merchant, you need to be licensed, right? So anytime you hold yourself out to be a merchant, or the law treats you as a merchant, you're a merchant. And this means, why are we going through this exercise? Because if you sell a product as a merchant, it's implied that it's merchantable. <coughs> so now the question, what is a merchantable good? Well, we look up here. And it says it's reasonably fit for the ordinary purpose for which goods are used. I like to say it's good for what it's good for. So food's good for eating. TVs are good for watching. If they blow up, that's a violation of the implied warranty merchantability, even though nobody says or writes anything. It's just not what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, there's this case up here, Webster versus Blue Ship Tea Room. Anybody read that? Yeah. That's a fun case because it talks about fish chowder, which I've never had fish chowder. I had clam chowder before. I thought that was the same thing. No, fish chowder I think has fish in it. Clam chowder I think has clam in it. I, but I don't know. That's just my – is anybody in here in that industry making food? Okay. Sell it, don't make it. <laughs> sell it, don't make it. Do you, do you ever sell fish chowder? Probably. I don't get to use it. Oh, okay. So there might be some in the store yeah. somewhere. So anyway, so it's fish chowder. And I think it's important to distinguish fish chowder from clam chowder because fish have what in them? Oh. Bones. <laughs> right? Look, you all knew. You didn't have to have a court to tell you or a big sign to say, caution, there's bones in these fish. You just automatically knew that there's bones in there. So when you read through this case, Webster goes to the blue ship tea room, orders up some fish chowder, and then what happens to her? There's a bone in the, there's a bone in the fish chowder. I'm guessing a fish bone. <laughs> and what happens to her? Gets lodged in her throat, and then what? Right. I mean, it's not just like, Gag, gag, ooh, I was scared. She has to have some surgery and it causes injury. So then the question is, should the seller be responsible for her injury? And so she goes to a lawyer and the lawyer says, here's all your potential claims. And uh, for some reason ends up with, the implied warranty of merchantability. Why? Why do you think, based on just what I've told you so far, what you've read, why are they going with this one? Because it's, they're wondering, is it implied that there's going to be bones? Right. It, it doesn't have to be anything anybody said to you. It doesn't have to be anything anybody wrote in the menu. It's just implied if Blue Ship Tea Room is a merchant, and are they? Yes. They're a merchant as to fish chowder. They sell it to a lot of people. D&W is a merchant as to lots of different things, uh, then if somebody's injured by it, it could be a breach of that implied warranty. 
Well, then the question for the court, if you look at the issue in that case, is, is somebody being injured by a fish bone in fish chowder a breach of the implied warranty of merchantability? What did the court say? No. Said, no, it's not. Why not? Because fish have bones. Not only that, but they even went further, which I don't necessarily like this part of the case. But what did they say about this particular case? What did they say about this particular case? Ratio of bone to chowder, 90 to 14, huh? So, uh, they said, she, of all people, should have known better. Because where is this case at? Anybody look at the title of the case and what does it say? Where was this case decided? Boston, right? Massachusetts. So anybody in that area ought to know uh, the fish chowder has fish bones in it. So basically, it wasn't a breach because it was fit for consumption. She just didn't watch out for bones. I mean, aren't there some things you just don't have to warn people of? Yeah. Now, what if you had said, I go into D&W. So now I know you work there. I'll pick on D&W <laughs> constantly. And it says, boneless chicken. Now what should I expect about the chicken? That it is boneless. What kind of warranty is that? An express. So there's a couple going there. Implied warranty of merchantability is that the chicken's good for eating, that it's not doesn't have any kind of diseases or anything. And the express warranty is that it's not going to have bones, so I don't have to worry about it having bones. Now then the question for the court is, you know, even though it says boneless, is there the potential that it might have some kind of little bone in it? Maybe. All right. Now, this next warranty does not arise all the time. It's not an automatic thing. The other thing you need to know about this warranty is that it doesn't have to be a merchant. This is an implied war warranty that can arise, doesn't always arise, any time a seller sells a product. And you will have it as long as you have check mark number one and check mark number two up there. So when the seller, merchant or non-merchant, knows the particular purpose for which the buyer will use the goods and knows that the buyer is relying on the seller's skill and judgment, you can create this implied warranty. So it's not just implied warranty for a general purpose, like food's good for eating. This is that this will be good for your particular purpose. So... Um, I was looking for a snowboard for my son who was five and that might seem kind of young but I should show I mean it's unbelievable I can I kill myself trying to do what this kid can do at five and so I'm like I'm gonna go out and not get one of these little kitty plastic snowboards but I'm gonna buy him a decent that was before I figured out how much they cost <laughs> and I'm like he is not worth that much man are those things expensive right Right. I mean, it's like pretty soon he's going to shoot and it won't work anyway. So, you know, I, I go to most places and they, they just really don't have anything for kids that little other than a little plastic stick or something. So I ended up going to, um, there's a place over in East Point Mall. Skate. Center Point. What is it? Modern Skate. They have snowboards there. So I'm in there and I'm looking and they have these really nice the Burton snowboards. I'm looking at them, and then the person comes over, and I'm like, well, how much do these run? She told me, I was like, I was like my father. What? You know, everybody in the store can hear me. you got to be kidding me. Now, I, I might have been a little nicer than that. but um, So if I just went into the store and I said, I need a snowboard, and they give me a snowboard, then it's implied that it's good for snowboarding. But if I go in there and I, I say to them, I have a five-year-old kid, this is their abilities, this is their height, weight, etc. I need a snowboard for him, then what should I get? One that fits his particular need, right? And so if it doesn't, I can come back. And it doesn't, they happen to be a merchant, but if, even if they weren't, 
So that means I could buy the snowboard where? Pretty much from anybody. And if I go and tell them what my particular purpose is and they say, this one will meet your particular purpose, then it better. But if they don't know why I need it, <coughs> then, you know, I shouldn't be upset when I come back and go, this doesn't fit a five-year-old, you know. So um, this implied warranty can arise. So you could have another potential warranty when you walk out of a snowboard shop. The implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Let's say I want to lift some heavy equipment. Uh, hoist something up into a barn. It weighs, I don't know, it's very heavy. 30,000 pounds. All right? It's really heavy. And exaggerate a little bit. So I go to the, uh, where do I go? I go to um, Gemmon's hardware store in Hudsonville. And I go in there and I say, I need heavy-duty rope. And they look behind and are like, okay. And they give me some heavy-duty rope. And I go and I start hoisting it up. Crash! It falls right on top of me, smashes me. What warranties were created? Implied warranty of? Oh, I don't think so. Apply warranty of merchantability, I think, because I said Gemmons, and they're in the business of selling rope, and they're a merchant, and they sold me it, and it's implied that the rope's good for rope. <laughs> <laughs> Tying people up. Oh, that's awkward. Um, other things, but, but not necessarily for hoisting 30,000 pounds up in the air. What would need to happen to create this implied warranty? I'd have to tell them exactly, not self-diagnose, I need heavy-duty rope, because what kind of rope says it's heavy-duty? They all say that. And the person who's there is like, okay, right? This is my theory. When I know what I'm doing, I go to Lowe's. Because no one there seems to know what they're doing. <laughs> Sorry, you work at Lowe's. You probably know somebody who works there, and I'm getting in trouble for it. But I'll go there, and I'm, you know, I'm set. I'm putting in my own underground sprinkling system. I know what parts go into it. I go there. I get it. Somebody asked me a question. I'm like, hey, never mind. I know what I'm doing. Get away from me. Don't. I'm a man. I don't need your help. Right? <laughs> but uh, when I don't, when I'm putting in my first toilet, I'm going to Gemmons. Because when I go there and I say, I need this, they don't just go, here you go, and read off the package. Or read the pa you love it when somebody reads the package to you? I need this. Well, well, let's see if this is it. I could have done that, right? So I go to Gemmons, and there's a retired guy there, right? He says, what do you need it for? I explain him to him. He says, well, then you need this. Don't get that. That will not work. You need this, right? So now there's this additional implied warranty because he knows of my particular purpose. He asked me what it is. And he gave it to me knowing I would rely on it. And I did. What if I go, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. And I grab something else and walk out with it. Is there implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose? No, because I didn't actually rely on his recommendation. All right. Overlapping warranties. We already talked about the fact that there might be different warranties in the same transaction. Um, so if there's an express warranty that covers one thing, there's implied warranties that cover another part of it, then I'm going to have that coverage with my warranties. Now, even though that's the case, there are some attempts to disclaim warranties. You know what I mean when I say disclaim? To say we're not bound by these warranties. I mean, I think you meant, we mentioned that white piece of paper. You walk onto the lot, and you're looking for that checkbox, and it either says whatever's left on the manufacturer's warranty or as is, no warranties. Right? So you're trying to say these warranties might be out there, but we're not going to honor them. So you could attempt to disclaim an express warranty. Notice what it says. The courts view this unfavorably. Why? Why would a court say your attempt to say you want out of an express warranty isn't valid? It's kind of an odd question, but 
why would you run around saying things that customers rely on and then say, you know, everything we told you, never mind. Right? It shows that they're dishonest. What? It might. It might. They could say anything to get you relying on buy the product and then go, ah, if you read the fine print, it says none of what we told you, you should rely on. So you go in and somebody, you say, well, what year is this car? And they tell you. And then in the written contract it says, we don't care what anybody told you. So courts view that unfavorably. Notice it doesn't say the courts won't honor it. The only time they honor it, though, is when? When it's written. And it's... And it's... Conspicuous, yes. Yeah, it's up there. So it's big font up there projected in front of you. It's conspicuous. You can see it, right? So if you're entering into a contract and somebody's trying to disclaim an express warranty, big font, obvious, so you can see it. Simple language so you can understand it. And done at the time you enter into the contract. That's why usually at the end of the contract it says, all this has been explained to you. You understand it all. Now you're signing here signifying you agree to be bound by it. Uh, there are implied warranties. We were mentioning them. And um, sometimes sellers attempt to disclaim them too, often, use, often using word as as is or with all faults. We're not saying it's going to meet your purpose. We're not saying that it's um, anything but what it appears to be to you. Like uh, winter is coming. Can you believe it? I mean, October went faster than... That's the fastest month I remember. Um, snow's coming soon. What? <laughs> Just seemed funny. I'll go back and listen to that later and say, what was so funny about that? Um, anyway, it was fast, and uh, winter's coming, and it reminds me of my snowblower. Um, I am not mechanically inclined. You're like, why? How does this remind you? So I'm not mechanically inclined. I uh, didn't know that much about snowblowers, never had one before. But I knew I didn't want to mix oil and gas. Right? I just knew that's a hassle, right? So I wanted the kind you just dump everything in and it took care of it. So I go into Sears. I don't know why it was there. I'm looking for a snowblower. There's four guys in another section of Sears. They're like, uh, we don't work over there. Yeah, I see that, but could one of you come over here and help me? I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, I'll try. And sure enough, salesperson comes over, and I say, this is what I needed to do. What did they do? Started reading the box to me. I'm like, okay, thank you. But do you know, what is this whole cycle thing? And how, how do I get it so I just put oil here, gas here, and it mixes it up? And he said, that's a good question. <laughs> like, can you give me somebody who does know something about this? I'm admitting I don't. So now they got somebody, right? And they tell me what I need, and so I don't get it there. But anyway. Um, they could attempt to disclaim some of those warranties. Um, they could put out an as-is or with all faults, but... In that case, there's lots on the box, right, that says what it is. There's lots that the person told me. Uh, so to try to disclaim all those warranties can be a little bit of a challenge. And besides, who wants to go someplace where you rely on all this and then you end up not being able to recover under any type of warranty? Now, there is a situation where your own refusal to inspect could affect your ability to recover under a warranty. Somebody says something to you about the used car, you could have easily checked it out, but you didn't. Or you ask a question, they're like, I don't know, but you could have easily tested it and found out. Like, what if they say, you're like, uh, I want an automatic. I'm like, okay, here you go. What might you want to do? Look, right? <laughs> Later you come back like, I wanted an automatic, this isn't an automatic. Okay, well, maybe you should look to see what it was. So if it's easy to discover, like the paint color, whether it's an automatic or manual or not, I guess nowadays that's a little more difficult. 
like I was reading some things online about different vehicles, and it, it seems like some automatics have shifters on them and these different modes and paddles, and you're like, okay, which are you? Are you manual? Are you automatic? I don't know. Uh, and then we've mentioned this term unconscionability before. Sometimes the court just says any attempt to disclaim all warranties is unconscionable. It would be unfair to the consumer to not be bound by some of the representations that you made. All right. The Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, a federal law to prevent deception in warranties by making them easier to understand. Well, that's the, that's the intent. It doesn't necessarily mean warranties are easy to understand. Uh, does not create new warranties. So express warranties come from what people write, what people say, the models, etc. Implied warranties, as it mentions up there, come from the UCC, not the Magnus and Moss Warranty Act. But it does try to make warranties easier to understand. If they are expressed in writing, then a full warranty, a consumer should understand that to mean free repair or replacement for the life of the product. covers everything. If there's a limitation on that in any way, then it's a limited warranty. So how could you limit a full warranty? By, by number of years it's covered. Right. So maybe one year only. Cars. What is the other way on cars? Mild. Right. How long? Right. I, did I mention I, my my one of my trucks blew up right after the warranty ran out? Driving down the road. Before I left on my trip, it was under warranty. As I'm driving, the engine blows up. Pull into the bank parking lot. It's smoke and everything. Blew a rod. I think. I don't know what that is, but I think that's what happened. <laughs> big smoke, big clankety-clank sound, right? So I go, uh, I have it towed to the dealer, and they, uh, they turn on the ignition. They're like, oh, man. You're a few miles over your warranty. I said, you mean to tell me, as soon as it went over the warranty, like one mile over, it should blow up like that? And they said, well, it's not under warranty. So I went back and forth with them a few times. And then the dealer made good on it, even though it wasn't covered under the warranty. They replaced the engine. And I'm glad it did, because it was expensive to replace. I don't know what I would, I probably would have just said, here, keep it, because it was enough that, I don't know if it was worth more than the truck. So anyway, sometimes people will make good on it. And it had not only the mileage or the years, but also what parts on your vehicle had different warranties. So like the drivetrain was warranted different than other parts of the vehicle. All right, Lemon Laws, this is, if you have an old edition of the textbook, it's not really in there. It's, it's more in the new version. This is like extra stuff you get for paying more money for the textbook. You probably have heard of these before. Uh, a lot of states have statutes. So this is state law um, that says if you have problems and you do certain things a certain number of times, then you may be entitled to have it remedied. And I'm real vague in what I'm saying because it, it varies by state and what type of product. A lot of people think of it in terms of new cars, right? That if you get a new car, expectation is that it will work. And if there's a problem, it'll get fixed and the fix will work. Uh, and people who have a new vehicle and they take it back and they keep taking it back for the same issue, which is usually a requirement under these lemon laws, that um, at some point the law says that's unreasonable. So, as it says up there, uh, it provides a remedy to consumers whose automobiles under warranty fail to meet value or performance. So, you know, it used to be manufacturers, uh, dealers would say, look, it's under warranty. We'll just keep fixing it. And then people would grumble about how they're just making money off of warranty business. And then finally, consumers were like, okay, but at some point, this is a big hassle. I should get one of these that doesn't do this all the time. Anybody ever had a lemon? You made lemonade? No, I got a car from a used car dealership. Like the electronics were kind of tweaking. So sometimes I 
like that security thing that mm-hmm. off the whole car. Sometimes Just shut off your car. Yeah. Sometimes that would happen, and then sometimes like my back, like uh huh. They kept fixing it and ended up working. So I didn't oh. Really call it a weapon, but yeah. Anybody else have one of those possessed cars? Our van did that. It started like tail light keep going out constantly, and then the lights and interior lights would go out, and then this wouldn't work or that wouldn't work. Uh, so finally, I took it in, and they'd replace the lamp, tail lamp, or whatever. Finally, I take it in. I'm like, "You've got to figure this out. This is driving me crazy." So they finally, and I'm sat there for half a day. Guy finally comes out. Like three hundred dollars later, he says, "It's a dime." I'm like, "What are you talking about? Your kids have been shoving change into your your CD player." <laughs> and whenever it makes a contact, it blows the fuse in your fuse box. So I went home and explained to him, Daddy doesn't like you putting dimes in there because it costs three hundred dollars. <laughs> then I made him pay me back. <laughs> In dimes, yes. Of course, then they shove it back in. All right. Uh, seller has reasonable attempts to fix the defect. It says usually for it. Really, it varies by statutes. Like, um, it's it, it protects both parties. So the seller gets a chance to do these things before somebody screams lemon. Uh, and and sometimes that is extended to used cars under certain conditions. Uh, and if not, the buyer has a remedy of a new car replacement of the defective part, or return of it, uh, return of all consideration paid. So, again, it's statutory. You'd have to look at the state and the particular statute. Uh, there are, it's not just cars. There are other, you know, appliances or other things that it could apply to. Lemon, lemon laws are pretty popular, though, in the automobile industry. I think it's now starting to include those big screen TVs now. Makes sense. Laws Makes sense. Th- it seems like when you <laughs> fork out a lot of money for something new and it, you keep having to get it fixed, people get upset and talk to. Yeah. yeah. I think it's gonna be the same way with the 3D TVs are coming out now. They may have some no problems with those. <laughs> well, I, th- I think some of those things could cost more than cars. Yeah. Well, glasses for those are like three hundred and fifty dollars for two pairs. So not only do you have to spend like thousands of dollars on the TV, but then you have to buy the glasses. So if you have a bunch of people coming over, I know that. you have to have oh glasses for God. everybody. Don't you do it like BYOG? <laughs> you can't, yeah, you can't watch it without the glasses, and those things are so expensive. Like, you can, you can either come over to my house and get a headache or bring your own glasses. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then at the bottom here, usually in those statutes, there's some type of process for arbitrating these type of claims. You know, how many times has it been... Have they attempted it? Has it been reasonable? All right, product liability. So we're transitioning out of contract land, warranty land, to tort land, product liability land. And so these uh, terms should sound very familiar to you. Negligence is one theory of product liability. Here's what I'm saying. At the simplest level, if you're harmed by a product, there are different things you could sue whoever made it or sold it to you or whatever. So one theory is that they were negligent. And there's different ways they could be negligent. And we'll go through it, but here's an example of that up here. How it was designed. What materials were put into it. So you could have a well-designed product, but the stuff that we put in it was cheap or defective. How it was put together. Um, even the warning label could be defective. Now, how's the warning labels defective? It could be defective because it's not there, or it could be defective because it doesn't address um, things that it should. Like when I get into my Jeep and I flip down the visor, what kind of things do you think it tells me? Of the, uh, Put on your seatbelt. Uh, uh, right. If you don't sit too close to the steering wheel, your airbag goes off. It'll really hurt you. Don't put your kids in a seat over here because the airbag will kill them. Uh, no car seats facing forward or anything like that. Um, mine says, mine has a picture of somebody veering sharply and rolling over because my Jeep has a tendency to do that. Yeah. Right. What are you saying? 
Uh, so yeah, it's got all these warnings and a failure to warn of those things. And you know, like people would say, well, that seems fairly obvious, but a failure to warn of those things can end up leading to liability. It's negligence and not warning of an ordinary person of ordinary dangers that they would expect to encounter. Um, another theory is misrepresentation that the reason you were injured by a product is because there was some type of risk of harm by the product and it was intentionally hidden from you. Like think about uh, cigarettes. Cigarettes have warnings all over them, right? But there have been cases where people have been able to recover. Like when um, light cigarettes first came out. You know, they were running around saying how light cigarettes were good for you. Yeah because they were light and they didn't have all the tar and nicotine that regular cigarettes. Well, guess what everybody did? They just smoked twice as many of them. So, uh, And they, they were held responsible for concealing those facts from people. All right, another theory is strict pro product liability. Remember, strict liability is liability without fault. It doesn't matter if you're negligent or not, whether you meant the harm to happen or not. If somebody's harmed by your product and there's a statute that says you're liable, you are. Notice it says in the second bullet there that the injured party could be a third party. So not the person who actually bought the product, but somebody who's in the room when that new 3D TV blows up in 3D. <laughs> and the reason that we have this even though it might seem unfair like you can't actually establish that the manufacturer did something negligent or intentional to you but you still get um, something for the glass that's stuck in you is because consumers should be protected from unsafe products even if you can't really establish why the TV blew up they're not supposed to and if they do people should be able to recover for that um, and whoever made it or sold it shouldn't be the ones to escape liability for that. And finally, they got more money than you because you, you paid a lot of money for that 3D TV. Now they got it, and you want it back. You want some of it back because it exploded. So this is the reason why we have strict, strict product liability. It might not seem fair. In order to have it, most statutes address these six things. So I'll leave those up there for a moment as I go through them. The product must be in a defective condition when sold. So there was something wrong with it. We don't have to establish that it was negligent or that it was done on purpose, but there is a defect. TVs in their natural state should not just blow up. And whoever sold it was in the business of selling those kind of products. And the next one, some statutes address this one, is that it was unreasonably dangerous. It's dangerous beyond its ordinary expectation. Uh, whoever is suing for recovery has to have, you know, it could be a third party too, but has to have incurred an injury to themselves or their property by using or consuming the product. And the, de the defect actually caused that injury and then finally, one of the big ones is the goods have not substantially changed from the time of sale. So it's not something you did to modify the product. Have you ever seen products that get modified after they're purchased? Mm -hmm. Like, cars is one of them. right, a lot of people do things to cars. What else? Lawnmowers? Yeah. In Sparta, Cedar Springs, they race them, yep. riding lawn tractors. Sure. Tractor pulls, yeah, they're not intended to soup up and pull really, really heavy things. Uh, I did that to the van. I put some nitrous on the van, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, all those things are uh, things that you do that may attribute to your own harm. And as a result, it's not the way it was when uh, it was sold. You guys got all those? No, they're also on the slides, too.
One of the most interesting ones I heard of was one of my uh, classes. A couple guys in the class did a daiquiri whacker. They hooked a Dodge Hemi engine up to a blender. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen these? I went online. I'm like, wow, there's a whole culture of this stuff. Like, you're hooking large Hemi Super engines up to different things, but yeah, <laughs> you put anything in it, like, <laughs> <laughs> and loud. <laughs> You good? All righty. All right. Um, these are these are slides. Kind of go into some of the detail of those six elements. Um, one of the problems. I mean, if you think about this, somebody's injured. They're in the hospital room, and what are they going to do to prove something? Um, they basically have to say hey, this product injured me in a way where that product shouldn't. They don't really have to show how it became defective. Right? Think about it. They could sue everybody from who made it to who sold it, you know, to who sold it to them. And they don't have to run around and try to figure out who's responsible. I mean, and think about that. That seems, it makes sense. But think about today's products, um, like a car. You know, at Ford, when Ford manufactures the vehicle, how many of the parts on it are from Ford? I don't know if any of them are, right? I mean, it, sometimes they're just a consolidator of parts. And so if they could just say, well, we didn't make that Firestone tire, or whatever it is, uh, then you'd be busy all, you know, for the rest of your life trying to track down who did what. So basically you say, you're all responsible. You sort out. Right? And that you know that's what happened in that the Firestone tire case where vehicles were flipping over and blowing up and killing people. You know people were like we're mad about that. Well, they weren't so mad after they died, but um, their estates were upset that this happened. And Firestone said we told Ford you need to have it on this kind of vehicle, not on this kind of vehicle, and inflate it to this. And then Ford said we did what you told us to do. Still a problem. Um, they kind of fought that out, but that's not the consumer's problem. You sold me this vehicle, you injured me, you sorted out with them. All right, and then the unreasonably dangerous element. You know, I, I guess it just comes down to that whole continuous discussion of what's reasonable, what's unreasonable, that there are some risk with using certain products. And uh, in some cases, all you can do is just warn people that if they use the product, they could be harmed. In fact... This is a little extra bonus here. You even have to warn of foreseeable misuse of products. Good example, good example of that is the plastic bags you get from the cleaners. They right. Work. Yeah, I mean, what are they for? They're for protecting your clothes, but what do they say on them? Don't wrap your kids in them. Don't, <laughs> don't put it on your head and wear it like a hat or something. So they know that people might do that. Or aerosol cans. <laughs> You know, you know, whatever it is, those are not for inhaling. They're supposed to be for other use. So if you know consumers could do those things, it's foreseeable to you, then you ought to let them know, don't do that. It seems a little bit crazy. Like my lawnmower. It says, can you guess what it says? Don't put your hands under the try to clean it. Don't put your feet under there. But guess what else it says? <laughs> it doesn't say don't stick your head in there, but that'd be a good one. It says don't use it to trim your hedges with. Why do you think it says that? Because some brilliant person. No, it's it's a push mower. It's not a riding lawnmower. Somebody <laughs> somebody picked it up and used not mine, but you know a push mower and tried to use it to trim hedges with and hurt themselves. Now you think you wouldn't have to tell people don't do that, but. Right. Your baby out you yes. Out. Yes. <laughs> My, our favorite one is um, with our first kid. We got one of these um, collapsible high chairs. Oh yeah. And it has it, it has the warning, you know. Like who is a brilliant person? Like I haven't seen Johnny since lunch. <laughs> like oh crap! I folded him up and stuffed him in the closet. 
So, yeah. Yeah, you'd think you wouldn't have to warn of those type of things, but people... Right. Yeah. What brilliant multitasker, you know, shocked themselves in the tub. Uh, well, kids will always figure out a way to do something with a product you never intended for it to be for. So, like they used to have those stroller, those things, those walkabout things, and they would launch down steps and stuff. So they had to modify them. And then they recalled a lot of them because the kids do the darndest things. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, eventually, uh, in the restatement of torts, basically a consolidation of all the cases relating to uh, tort uh, law, they came up with these, when you say defect, these different categories. How something's manufactured, how it's designed, uh, or the warning that's on it. Uh, even in the military, uh, one of the most common types of injuries was a head injury. And one of the most common ways it would happen is people would drive around with the steel hatch open and not wear a helmet, and they'd hit a bump, and the latch would come down and smash them right in the head. <laughs> and you think you wouldn't have to tell them, but you're all the time telling them. And, you know, another thing they would do is they would, they would ride like they were uh, captain of a ship or something. They'd be standing... Out. You know what happens if you stand outside of armored personnel carrier or any higher than about here? You get chopped off when you roll over. Because you're supposed to go in if that happens. But if you're out and you roll over, you lose your part of your body. So, But you still had to warn people, don't do that. Get down inside of it. All right. Uh, you know, even, this will give you a hint to where I live. On M6, where uh, 196 and M6 join, is near my house. And um, they, they built some bridges there, and they had to tear them down. That's why that part of M6 took a long time to get together. Because it wasn't that it was put together improperly, but that the design was defective. It would not support trucks which is kind of bad because that's what so bridges far? are for. How does that get so far? I, you know, that's, you know, I don't know, math error, carry the one. I, I, you know, I don't know how that happens, but they're like, oh, this is bad. Before we get a truck going now, we better tear this down and redo it. So I don't really know how far they got. I was thinking they were pretty much had it up and then realized it wasn't going to work. All right, some other theories here. Market share liability. So you got some products in the market that are alike, like drugs, for instance. You can get the same drug from different manufacturers. You take it from different manufacturers. One of the drugs, you're not sure which, injures you. Now the question is, who's going to pay? Well, one theory is that instead of you trying to figure out who did it, who manufactured that particular pill that caused you injury, you get to recover, and they all share in that liability based on how much of the market they have. Which to the, the, the company that there's no proof they actually sold the pill that, that injured you, it's kind of harsh. But from your perspective, you shouldn't have to spend your time trying to figure out who it was. And so if you own 30% of that drug market, you, you pay 30% of liability. That's one theory of recovery. Notice, notice the second bullet. All courts extend liability of manufacturers and other sellers to injured bystanders. So if, if you get uh, hit by an exploding TV when you're over someone else's house, you still get to recover. Courts say are pretty unanimous on that one. You don't have to be the one that actually purchased it. All right, defenses should sound familiar to you. Right, back to torts. Assumption of the risk. You knew you could be injured in this way. You still did it anyway. Uh, are there any risks associated with, with shooting handguns? Oh, yeah. Just, no yes, if, right. If you, <laughs> if you point it at yourself or you run in front of it, something bad could happen. Uh, knowing of that risk, you take it on anyway. Um, 
there was this case that kind of combined a number of these, including product misuse and knowledgeable user defense. There's these guys who are um, running around town having paint gun fights in their cars. I know none of you would ever do this, but... You know, they're fully outfitted in all their gear and everything, and they've got these weapons, and they're chasing each other around, and uh, apparently one gets up beside the other and blams the other one in the face, gets injured, sues the manufacturer, says, your weapon harmed me. <laughs> and now, a lot of times when we hear these cases, we're like, you got to be kidding me. You actually sued for that? Didn't you think you'll seem stupid? But... Um, they they allege that this should not have happened and the weapon was defective because it caused this extensive injury. And the court said, first of all, you knew there was a risk and you did exactly the type of thing that could cause injury. Um, you misused the product. It's not intended to chase people around in cars. And you, of all people, should know better. Does that sound familiar? Like We started in that case talking about this. Turned out they'd had hunter safety, trained in firearms, knew that you don't point guns at other people, any type of gun, even paint guns, which from what I've seen in the store, these, these seem like pretty powerful weapons. They can be bruises and stuff. Can be, depending on what, yeah. Because they need bruises on I imagine. I mean, it'll be more than these bruises if you freeze the paint. <laughs> well, that, that's an example of what? What is that called when you change the character of the ammunition? Modification. Modification of something after it leaves the manufacturer. So if you get injured because you got a frozen paintball, well, and then you try to sue. Wait, not if you accidentally leave the paint outside. Oh, brother. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, you could say it's an accident. But I would say if it accidentally did that, then it probably is comparative negligence. The manufacturer should be able to come back to you and say, well, yeah, but you also were negligent in how you maintained the ammunition or whatever. And then finally, the commonly known danger. Sometimes you can say, hey, the, have you ever opened your knife drawer? None of your knives say caution sharp on them, no. right? I mean, you just know that they, they are. 